What's the interpretation of the derivative of a vector valued function? Well, we're just going to draw that. So I will make a slightly different picture because I want to focus on a small part of the curve and I don't want it to be too curvy. We have our arbitrary origin. Now let's pick this point and say it corresponds to this value of t. And then our u of t is right here. So this would be u of t. Maybe I'll write it. By the way, one of the questions that you might have is that uh, you might object to this arbitrary location of the origin. Because if you choose a different location, well, maybe things will change. And the most direct question you can ask is whether the derivative, the value of the derivative, depends on where you chose the arbitrary origin. Interesting question. And I think I'm kind of thinking about this perspective, where we start with the curve, we choose a parameterization, we choose an arbitrary origin, and now we have a function. I think this is the, they're almost identical, whether you go forward or backwards, but I think this is how I'm thinking about it. We started with a curve, we chose a parameterization, we chose an arbitrary origin, and now we're wondering what this will look like. We already know what this looks like. It's this function. Uh, we're now wondering what the derivative will look like. Okay, great. Now I'll choose a small h, except just for the purposes of the drawing, I will choose a larger h that goes, you know, this is t plus h. So this is u of t, and let's just say this is u of t plus h. And usually you think of h as small, but I think of it as large just to make the drawing more, more clear. And so this is u of t plus h. Okay, great. So we, have, we now have this element and we have this element. Let's look for the next element, which is their difference. And this is another instance where it's well, why I like differences of vectors as opposed to sums uh, shines, right? Because to find this difference, we don't have to do any constructions. All we need to do is connect the tips. Okay, so this is... Well, maybe I can write it like this. <laughs> it's this difference on top right here, right? Okay? And just imagine, let's say that h at this point is 0.5. Right? So I have to complete the final step of dividing this difference by h. But before I do that, notice that the arbitrary origin has disappeared in the sense that it doesn't matter. By the time we take this difference, it no longer matters where the arbitrary origin is. Because this difference would not at all depend on where the origin was. Okay, great. So then the next step is dividing by 0.5, which is the same as multiplying by 2. So you end up with a vector like this. And the analysis of h equals 0.5 is finished. Now let's try to think about the limit. Let's take a smaller value of h. Let's take 0.25, one quarter. I submit it would be somewhere, not necessarily halfway in between, because nobody says that it's a uniform parameter, but it'll be maybe here, you know? It'll be a little linear, right? Meaning, if I half the h, it'll be half the distance. We should think about where linearity kicks in. But ultimately, things will look linear. Things looking linear as you zoom in more and more is the most important idea in all of calculus, at least in differentiation. Okay, great. So we would find once, so this is h equals 0 0.25. Okay, the difference. I won't even draw the vector because you know that all I'm interested in is the difference will be like this. That's the difference. And now I will be dividing by 0 0.25, which means multiply by 4. So it would end up being like this. Okay, things are getting a little bit messy. But let's continue pursuing 
the limiting process. Do you see how I made it four times longer? It's clear why, you know? And now maybe I'll take h equals 0.1. You know, accelerate it a little bit. I'm going to guess it's, it's going to be somewhere over here, right? <laughs> Zoom in mentally. The difference would be uh, like this, this vector right here, okay? And then I would have to divide by 0 0.1, which, is, which means multiply by 10. So I'm going to end up with a vector probably like this or something like this. And you can see how it's approaching a limit, okay? And I think it's intuitively clear what the most important property of this vector is. And maybe you can say it. Yeah, it's, the ten it's a tangent vector. Another, another interpretation that you cannot avoid. The derivative of a vector-valued function is tangential, it's a vector, so we can talk about things like tangential, is tangential to the curve that represents the function itself. If you are only 90% convinced, I will in a second give you another argument which will maybe convince you a little bit more that relies on that most fundamental truth that's at the foundation of calculus. So that will be valuable. But before we do that, let me ask you something about the length uh, of this vector. Because we started with the curve, and only once we had this geometric curve did we later impose a parametrization and chose an arbitrary origin. Now, the arbitrary origin doesn't matter for the derivative. And that's why we're not so worried about the origin being arbitrary, because in most problems having to do with calculus, it disappears as soon as you take derivatives, and you usually work with derivatives rather than functions themselves. That's another fundamental truth about, about calculus. When you're presented with a complicated nonlinear problem, the first thing you want to do is take the derivative of both sides, because derivatives are easier to work with than functions themselves. Okay, so the, ar the arbitrary origin doesn't matter. Does the parametrization matter? So maybe the easiest way to convince you of that is if the parameter increased in this direction as opposed to in this direction, then at the very least the arrow would point in the opposite direction. Do you agree with me? Right? If t, the way we did it, t was growing from left to right. But if t is increasing from right to left, then the blue vector would point in that direction. So that alone tells you that parameterization works at least a little bit, matters at least a little bit. But suppose I reparametrize the curve where h equals 0 0.5 was here. You know, what parameterization would that be? That would be t prime equals 2t, no, 1 half t. 2t, hold on. So h, one-half t. See, this is, I'm glad I made a mistake because this one-half versus two, is it times or is it divide by? Is it the matrix or its inverse? Is something that never stops being challenging. You always have to take your time. And when we get to tensor calculus, it offers you a notational framework where you would never make a mistake like this. So in this new parameterization, t prime, or maybe I should do t star, because prime denotes the derivative. The old h would have been roughly 1, and the new h, h star, is now 0.5. Right? So that's the new parameterization. Then the difference would be roughly twice as long, and then we're dividing it by the same value. <laughs> so it would be roughly still twice as long. And then everything would be twice as long as it was in the previous example. So for this parametrization that's related to the old one in this way, all of the vectors would be double. And so the eventual blue vector would be double. So parametrization matters for the absolute value, for the magnitude of the limit.
Another way to think about it that's quite intuitive is if you actually think about t as time, and you think of u of t as a trajectory of a material particle, then u prime of t is, of course, the velocity. And the velocity matters on how fast you're traveling along the curve. Yes? So, yes, parametrization matters quite a bit. Yeah. So it affects the magnitude, but not the direction. Because no matter how hard you throw the material particle or how fast your car is moving, the velocity points in the tangential direction, but the speed will depend on how fast the material particle or the car goes around the trajectory. Make sense?